we've got a lot of people joining us. Why don't we um, get started? I want to welcome everybody to the Remote Strong webinar series. Um, hopefully, you, uh, some of you, I can tell, have been with us. I'm looking at names um, for the past couple, and some of you are new. So we want to welcome you, and we want to welcome you back. Uh, today, we're doing Creating a Culture of Trust. And um, just to give you um, an idea of uh, how it's going to go, it's similar to our other one. We're going to have question and answer. And those are so meaningful um, to hear from you. So please use the Q&A um, box at the, at the um, bottom of your screen. And we will be monitoring, monitoring those as well. And I'll also be monitoring the chat, which someone says, hi, Laura. Catherine says, hi, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting when I see the chat pop up. Anyway, so we will be monitoring those. And um, so please, please, um, as you think of questions, add them throughout. We'll be doing that at the end. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Skaronsky, who's the principal consultant of EOS HR Consulting, and Laura Renner, who is the president of Freedom Makers Virtual Assistant Services. Um, again, there'll be starting the webinar, and then we will have, they have some offerings, so please stick around for those and the question and answer. So without further ado, ladies, hit it. Thanks, Jenny. Oops, hold on. Technical difficulties. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Laura Renner. I am the founder of Freedom Makers, and we pair military spouses with small businesses to provide support from home and um, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary in April. And so we've spent five years really honing in on what it takes to run a remote company. And that's where um, part why I partnered up with Sarah to offer these webinars is explaining sort of from the system side and things like that about how we've run a successful remote company. Um, and so that's where, what I've been bringing um, to these webinars to offer um, insights and to um, be remote strong. All right. And hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Skronsky. I am the principal consultant with EOS Human Resources Consulting. We offer HR support, outsource services, and consulting to small businesses who are not ready to have an HR person on staff. Uh, we have a team of, of HR professionals working to support those people wherever they are, um, whether they are a remote team or they are an in-office team, and um, making sure that they can deal with whatever struggles come up as they're trying to manage those employees. So we're excited to be here and, and take off on the next step of our journey. Yeah, so um, as Jenny mentioned, this is our third uh, episode or webinar so far in our series. And when Sarah and I talk about what we want to say and then organize it and put it together, one of the things that we keep seeing is they all, all the themes so far intertwine and they build on each other and they support each other. So we wanted to sort of highlight that, that um, so far we've talked about a general overview of Remote Strong. Our last webinar was on building a battle rhythm. And then this webinar is about creating a culture of trust. So it's sort of like those big picture, like high level um, concepts and we'll get more specific um, going forward. And so just wanted to show you and highlight how um, everything kind of works together to support each other or the opposite kind of tear them down. And so um, just thought, I don't know if this image does it, but that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> So the, the first topic of, um, in, in trust is transparency. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about why you need to have transparency, uh, creating vulnerability that, and how that helps transparency and then um, the politics and what that can do with transparency. And just to highlight as well, one of the feedback on our previous webinar was um, wanting more specific details about how to do things. So we are trying to make sure that we incorporate that going forward with um, getting even more specific about what our recommendations are. So um, again, continue to share that feedback with us so that we can improve these going forward. And, um, but so we did, we tried to do that today by making these um, way more specific as we um, discuss them. And so the first one around transparency is the why. And that's like, when an employee knows why they're doing something, they're gonna be more committed, they're gonna do it right the first time. Um, if it doesn't make sense about why they're doing it, why you're asking them to do it, then they're not gonna care and be less committed to it, right? 
Yeah, and you know, it's it's Simon Sinek has this whole theory around starting with why. And so you start with why for yourself, you need to communicate that out to your staff as well so that they are engaged and they're committed to what, what you're doing. An example of that is a car manufacturer um, where you know, the, the people are like putting, installing a certain part and they don't know what that part is for. So they don't really care. And they just kind of put it in willy nilly or, you know, just put it in there. And then what was happening was when the cars would get to the end of the factory line and the inspectors would inspect it for quality, they would find lots of errors. And so the quality inspection lot was very full with cars that needed to be fixed before it could be rolled out to, um, for delivery. And this other car company um, that rhymes with Boyota, <laughs> I know, I'm a geek, but um, they really focused on having every employee know what that part was for, why they were installing it, why they were installing it at the time that they were installing it as far as the order of the, the factory line. And because of that, because the employee knew when I install this, this is a safety mechanism for the seatbelt and that's why it needs to go this way and not that way or whatnot. Um, because they knew why they were doing each part for each, each action for each part, their quality inspection lot was practically empty because cars were coming off already meeting the requirements and the, the safety requirements and the, the, um, the ability for it to be ready for sale because every employee knew why they were doing what they were doing with as far as installing each part. And so that's just a, an example or a demonstration of why when your team knows why they're doing things or why you're asking them to do things, that um, that transparency leads to a stronger culture of trust. Okay. The next um, item in transparency is being vulnerable. And vulnerability makes us human. It's, it's about being human and it makes you more approachable. And we're not necessarily talking about, you know, showing showing everything and putting everything out there, but just acknowledging that we are human and we make mistakes. And if it's okay for us as managers and business owners to make mistakes, then it's okay for the employees to come forward when they've made a mistake and acknowledge that and, and um, own up to that. So it's kind of a two-way, you're building a two-way street there. Right, it adds to that transparency of, you know, I think part of it for us as leaders, we feel like we have to be perfect. And so then we hide our vulnerability because we're like, oh, we have to be perfect. If, if our employees think that we're not perfect, they're not gonna trust us. When it's the exact opposite, right? When they know that you make mistakes too, then they're, more, they're gonna be more open with you and trust you like, like Sarah was just saying, right? And like, um, that's why we were saying like, you don't have to show your warts, but at least acknowledge that you have them because then they know that you are believable, right? Um, and, and then um, they understand where you're coming from, right? And so, um, especially during COVID, right? If you're really facing some stress around the viability of your business and you don't share that with them, then they're scared and they don't know who to turn to, right? And, or you might be leading them down like, oh yeah, we're fine. And then suddenly you're not fine, right? And then that surprises them and then they don't trust you after that, right? And so then that, by you being vulnerable up front, they, they're more comfortable with knowing what's going on, right? Right. Um, and the story around that is, I heard Brene Brown share this story when I saw her speak a few years ago, and I know I probably am totally butchering it, but I, they were on like a camping trip or something, and they were gonna go swimming in this lake. And I think if I remember correctly, like she hadn't, gone swimming in a long time. So she was a little bit nervous to go swimming and it's open water swimming. So she asked her husband to sort of stay with her and keep an eye out on her um, a, as a way to sort of be comfortable with the open water swim. And he ended up leaving her. And she got really upset about that. You know, they, they got to the turnaround point, the like island in the middle of the lake. And then on the way back, he totally just left her. And she was like, she kind of took that personally. She's like, you know, he, he's not interested in me, like not from a relationship, but like he didn't care enough to make sure I was okay in the water. And that really upset her. And she asked him about it. And, and you know, it, it took a lot for him to say something. Like, I think throughout the whole day, he never said anything. And finally he did. And he's like, you know what? 
I was really nervous. We were swimming through a part where a lot of boats go through very fast and we had kids in the water. So I was really focusing on them and just making sure that, you know, if something happened, what was I going to do? How was I going to handle it? And just like really, you know, apprehensive about seeing if any boats were coming through. And the thing was, is him being vulnerable strengthened their relationship because one, now she knew that it had nothing to do with her. It had absolutely nothing to do with her. And yet he was also showing that he cared about something else, someone else in their outside of their family because of all the kids in the water. And so it took a lot for him to share that vulnerability with her, but in doing so, it strengthened their relationship because it added to that transparency. And and also just in building on the other um, levels of transparency, it also answered her the why of, of why she why he was doing that. And in explaining that and showing that vulnerability, it made it it made her understand what was going on so that she could then refocus her attention and and understand what why they were doing what they were why he was doing what he was doing. And to take that further, let's say there's another time this is happening where he doesn't seem focused on her then maybe she's not going to take it as, oh, he's not, why isn't he focusing on me? He doesn't care. He, she might then be like, oh, something else might be on his mind, especially if this happens repeatedly. So then that builds that culture of trust where she knows, okay, this is, he's not, not directing this toward me. He's focused on something else. And so, and I'm okay with that. Type thing. Right. All right. So then the, the next one is about avoiding politics. And this is not government politics, but office politics. <laughs> so it's, um, we want to make sure that, that um, you're, you're not creating a, a situation where it's us against them or that there's one group against another, um, but you're actually creating a, a situation where everybody is working together. Right. And it, it, when, when, you have, when you have transparency, there's no room for politics. There's no one to blame. You, that's when you can be a true leader because everyone knows what is going on and they're clear on it, right? I heard a phrase a couple of weeks ago that clear is kind. And so the, when you're clear, you're not like misleading anyone, even if you think, oh, you know, I don't want to let them know some bad news, but in reality, you're not being kind because you are misleading them. And so I love that phrase, clear is kind. And that is also adds to this when you're clear, you know, there's nowhere to hide and then there's no one to blame, right? So that's how you avoid politics by being clear. Um, so the example is if you have a company where you have managers of managers and let's say the, let's say I'm the manager, right? And, um, and I want Sarah who works for me to have a pay raise. And so I go to my manager and I say, Hey, I, I told Sarah that she's going to be due for a pay raise. And then my manager's like, Oh, we can't do that because the way our company policy is set up around pay raises, she wouldn't fit into that bucket, if you will. So then now my choice is I can go back to Sarah and say, Hey, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Um, it turns out that within our policies, we can't do that, but I'm going to work with you to find another way to recognize your accomplishments. Or I can go back and say, my boss said no, right? Because then that's me blaming my boss. It's me not being a true leader, sort of taking the easy way out, right? Um, and I can do that because there's no transparency around how our pay raise system works. Right. And so creating those, the, the policies and the structure and, and the, the drum beats or battle rhythms that we talked about last time so that people understand how the process works, then you can eliminate the politics because they understand what the process is and, and what to expect in that process. And I just want to add one more thing about transparency. I think sometimes we're like, oh, well, we can't tell them everything, right? We can't, it, it, we, you know, it's, it's too much. Like it's, um, some things are meant to be private and that's okay too, but tell them, hey, I can't talk about this, it's private. Right. That goes back right. to the whole, yeah, show you what my warts are, but I can at least tell you that I have warts, right? Right. Yeah. And it, yeah, we, when, yeah, definitely. When we're talking about transparency, we're not, we're not talking about like putting everything out on the table, 
but at giving people enough so that they understand why you're making the decision that you're making. Right. And without it feeling like, again, the us against them, and I have to hold everything close to my chest, and I don't want to, to jeopardize something else, when in reality, you're jeopardizing everything by not communicating anything. Right, right. All right, the next, go ahead. The next section we're going to talk about is intentions um, equaling actions and making sure that that one is equivalent to the other and you're not you don't have discord there. Um, and so the first uh, example we're going to talk about is unlimited vacation policies and um, ultimately these were set up as a sign of trust. But in theory, they people were taking even less vacations than they than they could or should because they were afraid that if they went away from work, that they would be dinged somehow, that it would look like they weren't participating, they weren't contributing. And and so it ended up the intention of creating this this bucket of time that people could take however much they wanted the action completely negated that in that it was it wasn't reinforced that we want you to take time for yourself we want you to feel better we want you to recuperate so that you can come back re-energized and ready to work it was it became a um a, a hindrance or a a chain around their their neck right and so yeah you, you, i'm i know everyone here has seen that where um, you know, like for example, a new law gets passed and somehow there's all these loopholes and whether or not those loopholes were intentional for our purposes today is irrelevant, right? The fact is there's always unintended consequences that come about from a law that's passed, right? And it's that same kind of thing where in this case, you know, in this example, the unlimited vacation policy had an unintended consequence. And I think the, for this one, we had three examples, right? And this is the first one. And they all have unintended consequences. But the beauty of being a small business is that you can make sure that you can sort of adjust track, right? So you can say, this is my intention. And when the actions don't match that, then you can course correct to make sure they do, right? And so this is a prime example. It was initially the ultimate sign of trust, like Sarah said, like, hey, you can take as much um, time off as you want. Um, we're not going to track it. We're not going to limit you, that kind of thing. And so, we, I mean, how can you say you trust someone more than that, right? Like, you right. Could, I remember when it first came out, people were like, oh my gosh, what about the abuse? Like, someone could basically be on vacation 24-7 and still get paid, right? And so, that this was like the ultimate sign of trust. Yet, yeah, what I remember a company or a friend of mine who worked for a company that had this, and he said, he, he never took vacation. And the reason why was because you were so afraid of falling behind. They were so competitive as far as what you could accomplish that taking time off meant you would fall behind and that would impact um, your view as a success in the company. So people never took vacation. It became a, it was so, um, what's the word? The, the market was so fierce that, that they never, it, it backfired, right? And so now, um, now the trend they're correcting that is that they're requiring you still have unlimited vacation but you're required to take a minimum amount of that as a way to to, to course correct right to, to to make sure that people understand we are serious we do want you to take this time we don't want you to and we don't want you necessarily to take time off and then work on your vacation we right. want you to actually take time for yourself and to take care of yourself um, because ultimately that that helps the company overall, but it it really is that um, that intention that making sure that it, that matches what they were trying to what the what the perception was. And I think that ties back to transparency in the sense that like especially as a small business owner, if you're saying this is my intention, you're being transparent and clear on this is my intention, these are my expected actions from it then people can come back and say, well, this is what's really happening or, or whatnot. Yeah. And so that, that the, our second example is a client that I worked with where um, the CEO announced that they were gonna be cutting costs and then turn around and bought 
floor seats to the um, Golden State Warriors. And this was for those, for maybe those not California based or Bay Area based, the Warriors is a basketball team, an NBA team. And this was right around the time they had won their first championship in a long time. And it became the start of a dynasty. I think they went, won two or three more after that. And so the floor seat tickets were quite expensive. They were something like $30,000, if I remember correctly. So they, he had just announced that they were going to be cutting costs that may have included layoffs. I can't remember, but then he turned around and bought these tickets, these floor seat tickets. And it's kind of like, whoa, wait a second there, right? And the thing is, is we don't know what happened. We don't know, maybe they were a gift. Maybe they were um, critical to a sale he was trying to land. We don't know because um, he, he wasn't transparent about it, right? But that, there's, that's a classic example of where intentions don't meet actions because the intentions were cutting costs. And then he purchased something that seemed frivolous to people not aware of. The decision process. Right. And, and a, a similar example is a company I used to work for. We, we were going through layoffs and it was, you know, around 2008 timeframe where everything was, we're cutting back the costs as much as possible. And one Monday morning, it was a small, very small business. One Monday morning, our boss shows up in a brand new Lexus and all of the, the management team were kind of looking at each other like, well, why is he doing this and what's going on? And, and having that intention not meeting those actions was very disturbing to us. And, and again, going back to the communication and the transparency, because he wasn't upfront with us initially, we were all very, we weren't trusting, we didn't trust what he was doing. And it wasn't until we actually called him out and he explained, well, I was able to go and get a cheaper lease. I was able to go and, and reduce the cost that we understood that his intentions were meeting, were um, equaling his actions, but we didn't have that trust and that transparency pr to begin with. So we immediately went to a place of defense. And so these all build on each other and you need to make sure that you have that transparency first so that your actions and intentions will be uh, people will assume the best of you versus assuming that you are trying to take advantage and, and that their, your intentions are not uh, meeting your actions. Right. And I remember when we, when you shared that story with me, Sarah, and it was kind of like, well, how do you, how do you know? Like maybe it just didn't occur to him that that was something that people would view as, as untrustworthy. So if it didn't occur to him to share anything. And it's like, you know, it's almost like, is the advice we're giving here useful or is it just sort of fear mongering if you will and it's like <laughs> i think the thing is you know erring on the side of transparency it as we said in that first slide you know you're reinforcing you're building this reinforcing circle right so if you're erring on the side of transparency then eventually people will start to expect that and therefore when you do something that seems out of character or that the intentions don't match the match the actions they're going to err on the side of trust Right, right, yes. And obviously in this situation, we there wasn't that trust there. So we erred on what is he doing versus if he had all along been showing that he, what he was trying to do, we would feel like, oh, okay, there must be a reason why he chose to do this at this time. And our final example for intentions matching, act, meeting, matching actions is um, a, a generic one in the sense that we've seen this kind of covered in the news or like how to articles type thing. And that is where when you say you want a team environment, you want people to focus on teamwork and work together, yet you reward people on an individual basis. And this is particularly present in sales where we see companies that say, yes, we want a collaborative team based sales approach, yet bonuses and commissions are given out individually. And so then that, that is a classic example of where intentions don't meet actions. And that's part of where if it might be a blind spot for you where you're not thinking about that, but as you think about how in within your own company, intentions are matching actions, like think about how are you rewarding people versus um, what actions you're expecting them to do. And like, um, it, at least in my company, I know for the longest time, I was very reluctant to have sales calls be, or sales goals because I didn't want 
um, my people to feel that pressure of any time they were talking to a client, trying to get them to buy more hours. I didn't want that. And I was terrified of that. So for the longest time, I didn't have goals. And we're going to talk about goals a little bit later. Um, but that was my thing. And finally, when we started coming up with goals, I just kept stressing to people, to my team, this isn't a goal for us to reach, but rather it's a reflection. If we are doing our jobs well, we're going to hit that goal. But it's not like, oh, I need you to, you know, hey, do you want to buy more hours? You want to buy more hours? It's not like that. But rather, if we're doing our jobs well, we're going to hit that goal. Right. And, and again, going back to the, or talking about the intention versus the actions, it's when you have salespeople who are not, um, who are so focused on themselves, then they are, are uh, disrupting and eroding that team environment. And so it, it, you just need to make sure that you're keeping that message consistent throughout um, however you're choosing to do it. And again, it's not to say that there's not good competition in sales and trying to find a way, but, but making sure that it's not so competitive that it's cutthroat and that, and that people are, are against each other versus for each other. I mean... You might want it that way, but well, if you do, make sure your actions are matching your intentions. Exactly. If that if that is what you if that is the intention you want, then go for it. <laughs> Just do it carefully. <laughs> That's next episode, right? <laughs> yes. Our next All point right. I wanted to make is about clear expectations, and again, that ties in with. Um, transparency and your intentions matching your actions but this is also about being clear with yourself about what you are expecting and what you're asking for and making sure that that's clear to your people and so we're going to talk about that with um, what you're asking what you're asking for as far as minimums the lanes of responsibility and levels of authority which tie into what we talked about last time in battle battle rhythm um, having the levels of delegation match and then of course everyone's favorite acronym keep it simple blank <laughs> all right so the first one is is about asking for the minimum but expecting more and in this case we're going back to the the sales example sales call example and if you're asking if you're setting a minimum standard that this is you know if you're doing this then then this is okay whether it's 25 phone calls or or five client visits or whatever that is, whatever that is, um, standard is, but then when they don't reach a higher standard, you're actually dinging them for that one. So in, uh, in documentation, your, your minimum standard is 25 sales calls, but in your mind, if they're not doing 50 sales calls a week, they're not doing well. Now you have a disconnect between what you're asking for and what you're expecting. And so it's really important to make sure those two things are connected and that it's communicated to the employee so that they can reach that 50 call, sales call number if that's what you're expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an example I like to share is um, in, in the Air Force, right? We have a physical fitness test that uh, all the branches do, right? Um, but in the Air Force specifically, um, you know, we have the different components. We have push-ups, we have sit-ups, we have a run and things like that. And if you just do the minimum score for each of those, you will not pass the test, right? You would think that, okay, if I get the minimum score required in each area, I'm gonna pass the test. But no, because there's a minimum overall score you need to accomplish as well. So that's kind of that example of like, they're asking for the minimum, but the minimum is not enough, right? The difference though is everyone knows that. It's very clear, right? If you just do the minimum in each section of the test, you will not pass. You have, there's a minimum overall score as well. And so that's that point of you can have a minimum, you can expect more, but you have to be clear that that's what you're expecting. Right. As we talked about last time, there are um, the, 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 a way for to have a good battle rhythm is when you have clear lanes of responsibility and who's falling within those lanes as well as levels of authority and that contributes to your battle rhythm but also when you don't have that then you have fog and you have friction right so if if something's in my lane and so, and someone else is doing it then i'm like oh why are they doing it it, it, it am i supposed to do it so then there's that un, unclarity right so there's that fog yeah. 
But then also going back to that Bernie Brown story, I'm like, what, why are they doing it? Was I not doing a good job? Am I not doing it well? Is my job on the line? Things like that. And so then that adds to that friction where I might resent the other person doing it. I might resent my boss for asking the other person to do it. And then of course, be filled with guilt as well for it. Was I not doing a good enough job? That kind of thing. So when there's a lack of clarity on the lanes of responsibility and the levels of authority, that adds to fog and friction within um, your battle rhythm of your company, which then erodes trust. Right, it all goes back to the trust. Yeah, I think, I think you covered that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and then with levels of delegation mismatch, um, to start with, uh, Laura, why don't you go through the five levels of delegation just so we know, so everybody knows exactly what we're talking about here. Sure. So level one is do exactly what I said, how I said to do it. Um, level two is go do the research, bring it back to me. I will then let you know what the next steps are. Level three is do the research, make a recommendation, and I will then decide based on your recommendations and ask you to do that. Level four is do the research, make a decision, do it, then tell me what you did. And level five is Take care of it completely. I don't even need an update. I trust you fully. And so in terms of uh, the, the clear expectation, it's important to realize that you can have a different level of delegation depending on a number of different factors. So you can have it based on a job. You can have it based on a level of a person's uh, experience in a job. So you might have one job, but you have somebody who just started with the company and you have somebody who's been with the company for a couple months and you have somebody who's been with the company for a couple of years. And so that, that first person is at a level one and the second person might be at a level three and the third person might be at a level five. But it's important that once you make that decision on whatever that level is, one, that you're communicating that to the employee, and two, you're sticking with that so that you're not suddenly expecting them to go and get work done and they think they're supposed to be coming back and telling you and asking your permission for everything. And on the other side of that, that you're expecting them to tell you every step of the way and they're just going out and getting the work done. Mm -hmm. Totally, and, and then to add to that, right, if you're saying you're a level five, I trust you completely, but then I always redo your work, that erodes trust. And it's like, well, do you trust me if you're going to always redo it? And so then that's part of that transparency, like, oh, I just am redoing it because I like to, I'm a control freak, right? In which case it's maybe really level four. Um, but it, that's one of those things where it's like, you have to be clear with yourself on what level you're expecting, and then you have to be clear with your people on what level you want them to work at. Right. And then our last one in this section is the keep it simple. Um, you want to make sure that your expectations are not too con convoluted or overwhelming, um, because if they are, then people are not going to be able to follow them, and they end up getting ignored. Mm -hmm. We see that a lot in bureaucracies, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, you, there are bureaucracies for a reason. You can't get around that per, per se. Um, but I think when you as the manager of your own team, keeping your expectations simple, well, it increases the chances that people understand them because they're clear and then they're gonna follow them. And so um, I think a critical part of this is guiding principles and core values. When you're clear on them and when you're simple about them, then that really helps guide the decisions and the actions your team takes. Right. All right. Our next section is about holding people accountable. And you want to make sure that you're measuring progress and that um, and that you're, you're maintaining that trust so that um, because of that accountability. Yes, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this one because as I was sharing with Sarah when we were preparing this is I've always been 
I don't want to say confused, but to me, the idea of holding someone accountable has been vague to me because in my mind, I feel like it's a bit elementary because in my mind, holding someone accountable is like, okay, you get three warnings and then we're going to terminate you, right? Like it's kind of a bit um, formulaic, if you will. And that's just not how you lead people with formulas like that. And so I've always been struggling with how to do that. And it was only in the last year or two where I've really started to understand that it's more than that. And it's, it, it can be just as simple as that, but not as formulaic, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail here. Right, definitely. And so it's, when you're talking about measuring progress, and I know, you know, Laura, I know you, you are, you are resistant to SMART goals, um, <laughs> but they're, but, you know, they serve their pur purpose, you know, so the SMART goals, for those who are not familiar, those are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And so you want a goal that you can set, basically, so that one, you're not setting them up for failure. That's the realistic part. Um, and two, something that you can measure. So, so have they completed it from point A to point B or wherever the, the end point is? Um, and that you are, that you're doing it within a certain amount of time. So are we talking about something they need to do in a week, um, a month, 90 days, a year, whatever that is? And the goal itself is something they're working towards, but measuring it is making sure that they are being held accountable to that and finding out why, if they're not doing it, why not? And is it because of something that is within their control and, and something needs to be self-corrected? Is it something that's out of their control, like a pandemic that suddenly shuts down offices and you know everything has to be readjusted and people need to understand and managers need to understand that that sometimes you're working on a goal and you get sideswiped by by something else that comes in that's more urgent, more important, and is taking your focus away from that. But without holding people accountable and, and talking and checking in then you don't know why they're not completing their goals or you don't know why they're shifting focus. Right, and, and I'll, so as an example of why I'm not a, I've never been a fan of SMART goals was, um, so I was going through this leadership development program and one of the goals that are areas I wanted to focus on was improving my communication. So I was like, how do you measure that my communication is improved? or that I've achieved my goal of improving my communication. Like, how do you measure that? And so that's why I've always been like, oh, I don't like this. Like, how do I measure it? But related to that though is at least by holding people accountable by measuring progress. So like if maybe the goal isn't to improve my communication, but rather taking steps to improve it. So what courses am I taking? Or now I survey my team rank me on this type of communication. How am I doing on this type and this type and this type? So that it, at least I'm measuring my progress toward it rather than saying, yes, I've achieved my goal of improving my communication because how do you do that, right? And so that was kind of where I always struggled with and like for sort of the softer goals or less uh, measurable goals, how do you have a goal like that? And so then I think that's why we put it under measuring progress you're showing that people are taking action toward it and therefore that's how you're holding them accountable um, and going back to the goal that i had about not wanting to uh, dis or misincentivize my team by having them push our clients to buy more hours rather stating often right that this is not a goal to sell but rather this is a reflection of us having done our jobs well Right. And so to me, that's part of why this has been so critical in helping me understanding about holding people accountable is even the check marks next to the tasks, right? So for us, as you guys have heard us say, you know, we're heavy users in Asana at Freedom Makers, we have a quarterly meeting where we set out what do we want to focus on in the next quarter? And those become tasks within Asana. Really, they might be goals, except we don't have an end state to them. But then as we identify the steps we want to do toward those areas of focus, then we can also, we give them due dates and we sign it, we check them off. And just seeing that that check marks are happening 
is a way of measuring progress and it's a way of saying, okay, you're doing this or checking out why aren't you doing these? Why do you keep changing the due dates and not explaining why you've changed the due dates? Like things like that. So it's not like that draconian, well, you didn't check it off. So that's three times in a row, we're going to fire you or whatnot, but rather using that time to check in with them. Hey, why aren't you checking these off? Or why do you keep changing the due dates? What's mm -hmm. happening? How, as, as, as a leader, how can I help um, get those barriers out of your way? Right. And then the, the last item is about being results focused. And this is, I think this is a big shift in mindset, um, specifically for remote workers, but I think in general, just realizing that it doesn't have to be time in seats. It can be how much are we accomplishing and, and what, do, what do we expect them to accomplish and are they being held to those expectations? So um, making sure that they're responding to things in a certain amount of time or um, completing tasks that in a certain amount of time, um, but being focused on that result, but not on, on, on just the fact that they're doing busy work for eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. All right. And then our last part about this is, you know, when you're letting someone slide and you're not necessarily explaining why to the rest of the team, then that erodes trust, right? Because they're like, well, why do I have to keep working hard if they're not working hard and nothing's happening to them. They're still have a job. They're still getting paid. They might still be getting their bonus or getting promoted. So why should I have to work as hard if they're not working as hard? So when you have that, um, when, when you're not holding someone accountable and then you're maybe not explaining it why to the rest of your team, that adds to distrust and erodes that trust as well. Yeah, and this is, this is a big thing where, you know, in terms of HR, there may be reasons why you are letting somebody slide that have to do with um, a medical reason or a personal issue that you really can't disclose to the rest of the team, but you can still, but you can disclose that this is something that you're aware of and that you are working on with that person. Um, and it may be that you're, you're shifting what their, um, what their results have to be. Um, but you want to make sure that that is transparent to everybody else so that they know, hey, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on and, and giving that person a little more space as they're dealing with it. Um, on the other side of that is, is a lot of times when people are, are not doing or are not holding their weight and everybody's afraid to talk about it, then there, then that's creating an anxiety within the within the company. And there have been several times that I've worked with clients where they have somebody and they're so afraid to take that step and take that leap of of making that hard decision to let somebody go because they're so focused on what's going on with that one person. They're not paying attention to the trust that is dissolving with the rest of their their team. Um, that when they actually make that decision to let somebody go, all of a sudden this weight is lifted off the rest of the team and the rest of the team becomes more productive. And, and so it's important to, to look at not just what is happening one-on-one -on -one with, a, with one employee, but how that's affecting the entire team. And to bring that full circle, right, when you have that culture of trust with the transparency and the clear expectations, then they, they can come to you sooner and say, hey, it's not working anymore. They're not pulling their weight. I know there's an issue that I don't know about, but I, it's becoming, it's eroding us. It's hurting us. Please do something about it. And when you have that culture of trust and, that, and the, the transparency, they're going to feel more comfortable pointing out to you something you may be missing because you are focused on that one issue. Right. So a lot of what we talked about today really applies in general to culture of trust, whether it's in person or remote only. And so we wanted to make sure that we highlight some things that are remote specific around building a culture of trust. <clears throat> so the first one I mentioned this briefly is the results versus the time and seats and being specific and clear about your expectations. Um, knowing what you want the result to be versus that you want them to 
show up and and be at a desk for eight hours a day. Um, there's a lot of studies that are shown, and we said this in the very first episode, that when you're in the office, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are you have a productive employee for eight hours a day. There's distractions, there's um, you know, people getting called into meetings and different things that are happening where um, when you're working remotely, you want to be working and focused on what is the result going to be. And you'll probably get a lot more results out of that person than you may from a person working in the office. Right. In a lot of ways, it becomes easier to measure productivity because you can see, okay, what did we check off? Right. What did we accomplish? Whereas, and you're less aware of, oh, well, so-and-so went to a concert last night. How cool was that concert? Or, oh my God, what is that smelly food that's being um, heated up in the microwave? You know, you don't have those distractions, but also um, you're like, oh, well, they were here every day, so they must be doing something. You, you don't really have to worry about that. You're more like, okay, what are the check marks that were checked off today? Or right. This week? Right. That said, though, because when you're remote, you lose out on the natural cues that happen when people are in the office. Like you can, you, I'm sure you all know this, like when you work in an office, you can tell when someone's having a bad day before they even say anything or do anything. Just looking at them, you know something is going on, they're having a bad day or they're in a bad mood, and then you can engage accordingly. And you lose that when it's a remote only team. And so you miss out on those natural cues because the only time you get together is for a meeting. And you, if, you're, if you're doing your remote strong, you have an agenda and you have a time limit and you know exactly what that meeting is about. So you might miss out on those natural cues, which also means you lose that human connection that we all know is so critical um, to having a healthy and thriving um, community in general. And with that too, you miss out on fun time, right? Like, oh, so-and-so went to this amazing concert last night, that kind of stuff. You don't really um, you have that because the only time people are engaging with each other is during a meeting when you have an agenda and a time limit. Right, and so it's really important to set aside time that you can check in with people, that you can, you know, if you're doing a daily check-in, make sure you have some time in there that, that is just, hey, how's it going? What's going on? You know, what kind of things are going on? And it, it could be something that, hey, I've got, there's somebody building a, a pool next door. And so there's, I'm distracted because I've got a lot of construction noise going on or whatever is, is happening that may be distracting them or frustrating them. In this time that we're in right now, you also wanna make sure that people are just okay. Like, are you, People are getting stir crazy and and um, it's getting really difficult six weeks in now that, that, you know, it's just like, hey, we're in this together. We've got this and and make sure that that you're allowing for that time for people to be human and to have that connection. Right. And so we put battle rhythm there in parentheses just to show how it all ties in together. So you want to make sure you're having regular check ins for the battle rhythm, but also so that you can check in on how your people are doing since you're missing out on those natural cues. And in addition to that, we highly recommend that you schedule fun time. Even if it's on Zoom, just happy hour, just talk about what's going on in people's lives that has no agenda, no um, target goal for the meeting, just a time to shoot the breeze really. And I've heard people say, oh, I don't want to pay for that, except you already are if you have an in-person shop because it just happens naturally right. in an in-person shop. So make sure, you know, be okay with it because that is what builds that culture of trust in your remote team is having some fun time scheduled in. Yeah, I know one of my clients, they regularly will do, um, you know, birthday parties when they're in the office. They would have a, and so everybody would come and do birthday party and, and have birthday cake. And so again, you're are you in some ways you already are paying for this when people are in the office of people taking a break at the same time. And so it's okay to to spend 20, 30 minutes and say, hey, let's get on the phone and just have a cup of coffee and talk. Or or, you know, hey, we're gonna celebrate Joe's birthday today. And so we're all gonna get on Zoom and sing him happy birthday or something something that's more um, engaged and, and personable than, okay, we're going to get on Zoom and get to work 
So it's just, um, it just brings that human back into it. Right. And we all know that when you know someone personally, you trust them more. Right. And that's, so it's like all feeds in, right? It's like all reinforcing. That's it. Mm -hmm. All reinforcing. Yeah. What were we talking about? We're talking about trust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then another remote specific um, element of trust is it really set that standard within your company to assume positive intentions, especially because with remote work, oftentimes a majority of the communication is written only. And so when you um, are sort of assuming that someone is writing you with anger or with um, concern, then you're going to react that way. And you're going to, it's going to erode the relationship that you have with that person. But rather, if you assume positive intentions, then it strengthens the relationship. And so some examples, you know, if I email someone and says, hey, so-and-so hasn't returned my call, then that person might be like, oh, oh my gosh, she's mad at me because I didn't return that call. When really, I'm just saying, hey, I'm just reaching out because I hadn't heard from you. Mm -hmm. you know or or this happened the other day like i called and i was or i was wondering where something was and it was simply that i didn't know where it was so i was just asking hey where is this document and but um the person not on my company of course because we have a culture of trust no but <laughs> <laughs> but the person was like thought that i was saying that they had dropped the ball and hadn't done whatever they were supposed to do with that document when really I was, I literally was just saying, I don't know where it is. I'm just asking where it is, right? And so when you have that culture of assuming that it's not an accusatory or a negative question or request, but rather I'm just saying it, then it really shifts the, the or reduces tension, if you will. And I, and I challenge all of you, try it. Like anytime you get an email or an instant message and you're like, oh, I can't believe they said that. Like really, like specifically say, wait, I, what, what if they asked it in a positive tone? And you'd be <laughs> amazed at how the tone of that email seems to shift instantly when really you're just shifting how you're interpreting what they're saying. Right. And, and I also encourage people that, that if you're concerned that somebody is, um, or, well, first to, to say that, that, when you're writing something there is no emotion behind it you can't you the emotion is what the person who's receiving it is perceiving it to be mm -hmm. and so it's important that if you are concerned that you find another way to communicate whether it's by picking up the phone or hopping on a on a zoom call and clearing that up and making sure because most of the time like you said it's it is not a negative. It is a positive intention. Um, as an HR person, I have constantly, I pick up the phone and I call people. Unfortunately, a lot of times their first reaction is, what did I do wrong? It's like, I don't know, what did you do wrong? <laughs> and and it, it has nothing to do with with what I was talking to them about, but, but I think there is this um, inherent feeling of guilt that I think a lot of people carry that is magnified when we're re working remotely um, because we're not able to have that to start it with seeing a body language or seeing that hey I'm, I'm calling or i'm writing this email with a smile on my face you're receiving it however you're feeling at that time mm -hmm. and so it's really important to turn that around and make sure that that you um that you don't assume something, but try it. Don't assume a negative, but assume a positive. Right, exactly. So really what it comes down to, as we've been saying in the past um, webinars as well, when it comes to remote work and a remote team, it's all about being deliberate. And so everything we talked to you about today was really about taking time and thinking through, how can I be transparent? How can I be clear about my expectations? How can I hold people accountable and making sure that my intentions are matching my actions? Because that can seem to happen naturally or at least subconsciously in an in-person team. But with a remote team, you have to be very deliberate about it because it just does, it's not going to happen naturally because people aren't together. Right, right. It's, it, is, it, is, it has to be a very intentional and a very deliberate choice to create trust in your culture. 
mm -hmm. and create to, and that and again most of what we talked about today is for any company not just for remote but it does have to be um you do have to work a little bit harder with remote uh with a remote team to make sure everybody's on the same page all right so before we open it up for questions um laura and i just wanted to make sure you were all aware of our poly our um, packages that we have available um so eshr is still offering the pandemic policy package i want to remind everybody that this is these are the policies that have to do with the ffcra this is the family first coronavirus response act these policies have to be in place through December 31st of this year. So even if you're not working or your employees are not working right now, um, when they come back to work, these policies do need to be in place. And so we can help you get these created, as well as if you're um, still working from home or you want to continue working from home, we can help you get that policy set up as well. Uh, this is a value of $149 and we're offering it to um, to our participants at $99 right now, and you can go to go.eoshr.com slash COVID to um, sign up for that package. And our thing at Freedom Makers, we're very big on systems and workflows and having everything run efficiently so that your team can run efficiently. So that's part of what we're offering is helping you to do that um, with what we're calling a battle rhythm audit. So we'll go review with you what you're currently doing and we'll um, offer ways to improve that and so we've been offering this special at, at half um, half our normal price um, using the code COVID and so you can go to our link or put your phone camera up to the QR code and that will take you to the sign up form. And one last thing before we go our next um, next workshop in this series will be on keeping it legal. This is, this is my jam, keep it legal. Um, May 14th at 11 a.m. You can register at go.eoshr.com slash legal. And we hope you will join us. And I will turn it over to Jenny. Are there any questions for us to answer? Yes, there are a couple that came in through the Q&A and then a couple that came in through the chat. Um, the first one is from Wade, um, to help with expressing positive intentions in written form, should we consider using emojis? I'm a big fan of emojis. And in fact, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a bit of an old school emoji person where I like do the colon parenthesis type thing. And, um, in Asana, it was coming up as like a muted smile. And so I actually, we had a whole conversation about it. It was like, why does this, is this smile, is this person smiling? And when I quote this, I want it to be smiling. And so then I, I had to be taught how to choose the emojis so that it was a bigger smile, right? So <laughs> I'm a big fan of emojis. I am, and I know it depends on the culture of your company as far as what's allowed or what not. I think it's becoming more acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, but, and in fact, some programs automatically, if you do the, colon parentheses, then it automatically converts it to an emoji or whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think that's critical to, um, to communication. And in fact, um, another thing is like in Asana at Freedom Makers, our culture is you can like something, right? There's no reaction. It's just a like button. And we use that to indicate we've read it. So it's like just an acknowledgement. Hey, I saw what you said, and I'm just acknowledging that I've done that, right? And so when we were preparing for this, um, Sarah indicated that she had completed something and, so, and I liked it. And she said something like, oh, you like that I got a task done? I'm like, oh, that's how we acknowledge that it's done. <laughs> so it's nice because it's like a positive, like, hey, right? And so, but yes, in general, I'm a fan of emojis. Yeah, and I think especially, you know, there, there may be a difference between communicating internally and externally. Um, so internally, you might use emojis to, so that you can soften um, the words and, and make it and put that emotion into it, which is really what emojis are all about. Um, and externally, then it becomes a choice of the, the management of is this some is this how you want the company to be portrayed. And I'm not saying that it's that it's not okay. I'm just saying that some some companies may not want that to be how they're portrayed to their their customers or their clients. 
I'm I'm a fan of emojis. I I use emojis all the time. Um, so it's I just want want to make clear that you can choose and you can have a um, a difference whether it's internal or external communication. Um, and then you know going back to what you just said, Laura. Again, it's it's about setting that expectation and knowing how you guys are communicating internally. And because I was jumping in in the Asana situation, I was jumping into Freedom Makers Asana. I didn't know what their communication style was, so I was like. Oh, okay, this is something new. <laughs> I think related to that is you want to also keep in mind about general communication trends, right? For example, for the longest time, exclamation points were seen as yelling, but now it's to the point where one exclamation point is expected all the time, and it's two or three that if you're yelling, right? So right. one is excitement. Like if a client or someone reaches out and say, hey, I'd like to learn more about your services, great and so it's like expected to have an exclamation point because if you don't then it's like great you know so, <laughs> so, or like i don't know how many of you noticed our entire slide deck was in all caps today we did that on purpose and, and now we're, we're not yelling right and i don't think hopefully no one took it that way so you have to keep in mind that uh written trends may be changing and you want to but that goes back to being clear like i expect everyone on my team to not use emojis if that's the culture you want to have, right? So just be clear. That's a good question. Um, in your experience, have you found there is a suggested number uh, range for SMART goals per person, like three or three to five per person, or or what is a good number to give per person? I would I would say um, probably two, uh, three, no more than five. Um, once you kind of have, once you get too many goals, then and you, again, it's all about being realistic of like, what can a person actually achieve? And so there may be a short term goal of like, okay, this is your one month goal and this is your 90 day goal. Um, but you don't want them to get so bogged down in, in these goals that they're not, at some point they got to get the work done too. <laughs> so so you, you want to make sure that you're kind of balancing that. So I usually try to stick to um, around three. I don't have anything to add. That was good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the final question came in through chat. Um, so what, you know, creating this culture of trust, um, you guys gave really great um, examples and everything. What is your biggest, like that you have experienced in your businesses, because you're both small business owners, like the biggest stumbling block um, to, you know, have you, have you run into that before? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there is a reality to small business, right? There is a reality. There's, you know, and I think, it, I, I think one of the things, um, and now I, I can't remember if we said this today. I know we said, we said it last night, but this is an, an evolution, especially with a small, a small business. Is is that you? You are. And that's, that's part of showing and being transparent and letting people know that you've got warts and, you know, again, you may, may not show them, but you have to be able to transition and like if something doesn't work, be able to say, okay, that didn't work. And so we're, you know, now we're going to try this. And and a lot of that is um, trusting the people that are working for you. Um, and, you know, and, and those are, those are the hard decisions, um, because sometimes, and, and that's when you decide, is this somebody that I want playing in my sandbox or not? Because if I can't trust the people that are working for me, they're not going to trust me. And, and it goes both ways. So, so it's really important to, you know, recognize as a small business owner quickly that if something's not working, you do need to pivot. Um, and when I say pivot, I'm not talking about pivoting your whole business like people are talking about right now, but just pivoting what that action is or how you're communicating or, or hey, what I said was taken wrong. Let's correct the assumption here. Let's correct what people are thinking um, and do it faster and do it sooner rather than later. Um, and, you know, I think, I think both Laura and, our, Laura and I are, we're, we learn every day. I know we, you know, we talk all the time about, oh, this is what's going on in my business today. And the problems we were having five and six years ago, 
or even when we first hired our first employees a couple of years ago are so different because of the things that we've learned along the way. And so this is not a one and done type of, of okay, you're going to set your culture and it's it's right and you've got it. This is a, oops, okay, let's try something else. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know we've gone over, but I'll just share an example. Um, and, and related to that, right, we're still small businesses. We're still very small businesses, right? And so in, in like in our case, one employee change will change our culture, right? Yeah. And so that's one of the things too. It's never set in stone. You're going to always be um, going with the tides, if you will, when it comes to culture. And the bigger you are, the less impact one employee change will have. But when you have, you know, three, four or five employees, one employee will change that culture. But um, just a quick example. Um, so I, yeah, so Jenny is on a, my team as a free maker. She's our marketing manager. And um, it was right around the time she had joined and we had someone else on the team. And we thought, let's um, reach out to our clients and ask them to share what they like about their freedom makers in order to highlight that um, for to the community at large. And I think it was actually coming up on Military Spouse Appreciation Day. So that's why we were doing it. So Jenny emailed the, the success manager at the time asking, hey, can you reach out to our clients and ask them to share what they love about their freedom maker? And they responded, no, why would I do that? I don't, I don't want to violate their privacy. And like, I think they ended up emailing it out, but then saying, we will not share this to anyone. Like, this is just private. And so there was a mismatch there, understanding around what we want to share publicly, why our clients who are also business owners, we would assume they would want to share it publicly, things like that. And so that kind of, I think eroded a little bit of trust between the two of them that we did have to work through. And that was, you know, a few years ago. And so we, we certainly have built beyond that, like what Sarah said about um, changing and growing and maturing and how we approach our business and what we expect from our team members and therefore further um, uh, improving on that culture of trust. And I would say Asana helps that because it helps us with our communication. If we would have had Asana back then, we would have been good. <laughs> so, we were a lot younger back then too. So we, that we, is true. Yeah. That is true. Well, I just want to um, thank everybody for attending today. It's so great to see you guys. It seems like we meet up every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, we look forward to seeing you in two more weeks on the 14th of May, same time, same place. Um, so, uh, keeping it legal. I'm actually really excited about that one. My, my dad's a lawyer and I grew up that way. So Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep us straight here. So that's my goal. <laughs> bye everybody. Have a great week.